today. Another 10 musicians and another 10 things that play a big role in framing this sound, this style, uh, and even their attitude. And this time around, it's not all about those little boxes of tricks at their feet. Still a bit techy though, so there is that. Hello again, Darren back uh, digging into a few of the tonal tricks behind some classic uh, punk and post-punk artists and the sounds that they create. As ever, taste, ideas and execution are still my watchwords. I will also be attempting some uh, impromptu ham-fisted demos uh, again, uh, and I will warn you before getting all techy on you. So, off we trot. And first on my list, I have uh, Ira Kaplan and the Proco Rat. So Ira Kaplan and Georgia Hubley uh, formed Yola Tango, get this, nearly 40 years ago now, back in 1984, which makes the band only uh, marginally older than the pedal we're talking about here. That is the Proco Rat, which uh, originally went into full production in 1979. And this pedal was on release, aimed squarely at the rock and the metal players, uh, gaining early fans in uh, James Hetfield and Kirk Hammer of Metallica, uh, Joe Perry, uh, Joe Walsh, uh, Jeff Beck even. Yeah, at its heart, the rat is a pretty simple op-amp based distortion circuit with some hard clipping diodes, you know, tacked onto the end to increase the amount of uh, distorted, uh, the fuzzy edge uh, coming out of the amplified signal. It's a simple enough circuit that a complete electronics dunce like myself can put one together on a prototyping board uh, and actually manage to get a sound out of it. Uh, you should be looking at uh, my handiwork right now. Uh, but anyway, back then to uh, Yola Tango. Uh, and why would someone like Ira uh, want, you know, a hard rocking pedal like a rat? Well, there are a few reasons I can think of. Uh, one, uh, it actually sounds really good. It's dead easy to dial in yeah, a great distorted sound with just those three knobs. Two, uh, it is surprisingly versatile. Yeah, if you max it out, it sounds very thick and fuzzy without getting all kind of overbearingly shouty and blur like a Big Muff can. Uh, sorry again, Big Muff fans. Yeah, but if you dial it back, it does a really great kind of slightly ragged, edgy, overdriven sound. And thirdly, yeah, cost. Rats have always been cheap, which uh, for hard up indie rockers has always been a primary concern. And in fact, the list of, you know, punk, grunge, indie guitarists who are rat fans, rat users, is something of a who's who. Uh, Radiohead, pretty much all of the guitarists there use one at some point or another. Peter Buck, Kurt Cobain. Dave Grohl, Graham Coxon, Thurston Moore, Stephen Malkmus, uh, just about everyone really. But you've got to go the extra mile to land on this list and uh, Ira takes it uh, this time for having not one, but two rats on his pedal board. One for the kind of lighter overdrive sounds and the other for the heavier, fuzzier sounds. Sorry guys, it's a numbers game and uh, yeah, Ira just clearly wants it more. I've already spoiled this a little on the intro, but here's my take on Yola Tango's Deeper Into Movies uh, using a cheap rat clone. Uh, it's the TC Grand Magus, as you'll see, set with the gain at about the kind of nine o'clock uh, point, which is in that kind of bristly, bitey, overdriven zone. Yola Tango, I think it's the simplicity and the versatility that really is in the rat's favour here. You know, the band do everything from kind of slightly 60s folk poppy influenced stuff to, you know, you know, very heavy kind of freakouts, shoegazy style textures. And I think with a couple of rats, you can cover the whole lot. And second on this list, I've got uh, Geordie Walker of Killing Joke and, uh, well, his, his entire rig, basically. Yeah, and here's where I start to twist this format of mine a little bit. I, I featured Geordie in my alt guitar heroes list where I did touch on a few elements you know, of his setup, but uh, really I think his tone is interesting enough that it's it's technically and musically speaking, you know, well worth a deep dive. Yeah, his sound marries that kind of tight, muscular, you know, industrial chug um, with a kind of spiraling, modulated, that kind of dizzying riffing of his. Uh, timing wise, he is super, super precise as a player uh, and a real master of dynamics, which he has to be uh, using that hollow body electric of his with the gain as high as it is. And I think for me, it was only when I tried to approximate his rig that it all kind of clicked into place for me. Uh, there are some very specific choices of 
effects of their settings, of their placement, that really play to his very specific strengths and playing style and contribute hugely to that killing joke tone. Okay, a quick run through Geordie's rig. Um, he gets most of his driven distorted sounds from honest to goodness, you know, valve power amps. No real need for drive or distortion pedals here. He then goes into an Electro Harmonics Deluxe Memory Man, which provides yeah, a light chorus sound and some slap back echo. Uh, a brief description, slap back is you know, a very short delay setting, usually between about 50 and 150 milliseconds, which gives you a very short, tight echo sound. It's more uh, like someone playing in a kind of a bright tiled room, a very quick kind of lively reverby type sound that doesn't hang around too long and doesn't muddy up the original sound. Uh, it's very characterful. Think uh, 1950s rock and roll, Elvis Presley, Sun Studio, that kind of thing. The Memory Man has two outputs. Each one of those is fed into a separate double unit. Yeah, it uses Bell Electrolab's ADT, that's automatic double tracker, rack units. Yet yeah, this is a pretty oddball gear choice here. They're, they're quite obscure bits of gear from the mid to late 70s. Rare as hen's teeth now. There is a YouTube video out there of someone demoing it, ready to sell it. And uh, guess what? Yeah, he sold it to Geordie's Guitar Tech. But really what they do is almost the same job as the Memory Man. They add more of that short slapback delay. That's the doubling part of that ADT name and a bit more modulation. And these then output to a pair of amps, to Berman amps, 70s British amp, kind of martially a bit, I guess, uh, working in stereo. Uh, and the effect of the whole chain, uh, well, those short kind of cascaded delays, they really thicken the sound, you know, doubling the sound with only a very short, tight delay, you know, nothing too washy. And those uh, stacked choruses going left and right are the bits that add that really swirling modulation. But uh, to my ears, at least, there seems to be a really cool frequency dependent thing going on here. That means that Geordie's low end seems to stay thick without losing any definition. It keeps that kind of chunk that you get for the heavier riffing. But the modulation, it just seems to latch, seems to catch, hang on to those higher frequencies on the treble strings. It's a very clever balancing act. You know, he gets his cake and he eats it. Uh, he gets the clear, thick riffing and he gets those pretty lead tones. Uh, for my attempt here, I'm using an Ibanez hollow body with P90s, kind of like a casino, uh, which is as close as I can get to Geordie's uh, ES295. I'm using a little bit of marshall -y drive from a pedal. Um, I'm using the Memory Man setting on my Bell Epoch Deluxe for that initial slapback with a little bit of chorus. And then I'm getting a stereo modulated slapback from an Eventide micro pitch, which is going to left and right amps into my stereo 2x12 cab. Yeah, all the elements of Geordie's chain are basically there. Um, and I've dialed them in as close as I can using the information I've got and, and by ear. And uh, yeah, here's the result. This is what it sounds like with the main verse and chorus of Kings and Queens. <laughs> Hopefully you can hear that chug all intact there with the chorus sitting on top of it without getting overly muddy. Yeah, I don't know if Jordy planned it this way or if it just evolved with his rig through trial and error, through luck. I can't say really, but either way, it's a great sound. I, I mean, Jordy's sound, not mine. Okay, moving on third up, I've got uh, East Bay Ray of the Dead Kennedys and the Maestro Echo Blacks. Yeah, I talked a little about Ray in my uh, Guitar Heroes video, but um, being as tape delay came out last time in the shape of the Space Echo with Johnny Greenwood, uh, it seems a shame not to take some time out and marvel at uh, the Echoplex. Yeah, unlike the uh, Space Echo, the Echoplex is a you know a single head recording uh, tape delay. Yeah, one tap played back, delayed by varying amounts, um, depending on the distance between the recording and the playback head. But that tape sound, you know, that that tape echo sound, the gradual loss of fidelity, particularly in the kind of the, the lows and the low mids, um, is the key thing here. Yeah, the Echoplex has been around a long time since the early sixties. Ray used a slightly older, the solid state version. It's still tape, but uh, no valve or tube preamp uh, to get his signature sound. 
Uh, and that is, uh, you know, a very wiry, spiky punk rock take on that kind of surf rock sound. Trashy, clangy, kitschy, <laughs> not overly driven or distorted, though, but but just edgy, you know, chirpy. Those echoes kind of filling out what space there is in between all those fast, riffy runs that, you know, Ray excels at. Yeah, I've had a go at Police Truck here using uh, the Bella Pox to luck again, which I think is still the best Echoplex emulation out there. Uh, at least to these battered old ears, and uh, with just a little dash of drive to pep things up. Yeah, um, I really can't get these tired old fingers of mine working quite as hard as Ray's, but you should get the idea. A guitar with a bridge humbucker really helps a lot here to get that edgy trebly tone of Ray's. Uh, he used a Japanese Telecaster with a bucker in the bridge for a lot of his stuff. Yeah, a very cool, utterly distinctive style and tone, I think, with that tape echo, just an integral part of it. Okay, next up, and upping the ante in the kind of trashy, kitschy, you know, weird out stakes following Ray, um, I've got at number four, uh, Mark Mothersbaugh of Devo and the Electro Harmonics Frequency Analyzer. Devo, what are they? Pre-punk? post-punk, art-punk, surreal pranksters, synth-poppers even, uh, they're very hard to pin down. And uh, so is this combination of guitar and pedal, uh, with various appearances over the years, the guitar sometimes changing, the pedal sometimes substituted for another, but the recipe is always the same. Basically, some kind of trashy, fucked-up guitar with a ring modulator duct tape to it. Uh, this feels like the next step up, or, or back maybe, being as they were all about de-evolution, from that kind of Thing that John McGough was doing where he had his pedal mounted on a stand so that he could uh, twiddle the knobs, uh, except this time it's just attached directly to the guitar's body. Yeah, this is what I guess you call an onboard pedal right there, right next to your picking hand, uh, blending in seamlessly with the sleek lines of the instrument. Uh, no, wait, sorry, it, it's just lashed on there with some uh, gaffer tape. Yeah, this arrangement was forever associated and often deployed uh, for the band's infamous cover version of the Rolling Stones' uh, Satisfaction. And this is, I think, uh, pretty much the ultimate statement of intent pedal use. Uh, a crazy sci-fi, you know, malfunctioning robot sounds, you know, like a synth being dropped into a bathtub uh, whilst covering, you know, one of the most iconic British Invasion R&B hits of the 1960s. Yeah, I think it's probably less about the actual use of the frequency analyzer or whatever ring mod they happen to be using that week. And it's more about what it means. It, it, it's portraying an attitude, an aesthetic. An upending of convention, you know, a gleeful trashing of expectation. Yeah, you know, there's no reverence here. Yeah, ring modulators, they scream the future and technology at you whilst being stubbornly resistant to any real melodic use at all. You know, ring mod equals chaos. Yeah, there's there's lack of control. There's a yawning gap between the note you hit and, and the sound that actually ends up coming out. And I think for a band named after that loose concept of de-evolution, you know, dysfunction, confusion, regression despite progress uh, the ring modulator is an amazingly appropriate signifier of intent uh, both sonically and philosophically okay here's the point where this list is going to take a bit of a detour so far we've looked at pedals rack units digital algorithms even whole effect chains in some cases yeah it's time to put these things aside for a little and go right back to the actual creation of that sound and that's the moment when a pick or a finger hits a string or strings and the notes jump out. Yet yeah, the next run of entries on this list are all about tunings and the strings and the instruments themselves. So first up at number five, I've got uh, Ricky Wilson of the B-52s and his tunings. Yeah, I've talked a little bit about Ricky already, but I think both he and the next guitarist on this list um, may need a little more love. Yeah, first incarnation of the B-52s had no bass guitarist. This is circa the first four albums uh, before Ricky's death. Um, so that's from the debut self-titled album right up to Bouncing Off the Satellites. So between the drums, percussion and keys, this left a lot of space to fill behind that three-pronged vocal attack of this. And Ricky adapted both his playing style and his guitar tuning to accommodate this and to slot in with the B-52s. Very unique, I think, musical aesthetic. Kitsch, dancey, a surfy, uh, heavily influenced by the kind of the trash pop culture of the 50s and 60s. For Ricky, this was a very physical thing, often involving the removing of strings 
to separate the fretboard into a bass side and a guitar side with a gap in between. Yeah, he used several tunings, uh, mostly involving no D, sometimes no G string as well, um, and often going lower on the bass strings and then doubling up on the guitar strings. Yeah, you should see some of those up on, on screen now. There's some pretty odd stuff there, you know, if you're coming from you know, a standard guitar play tradition. And uh, in Ricky's own words, he said, uh, I just tune the strings till I hear something I like and then something comes out. No, I don't write anything down. I have no idea how the tunings go. Uh, clearly someone started taking notes eventually, but uh, yeah, it's uh, these tuning choices, I think, and that old blue Mosrite guitar of his that was responsible for that sound. Yeah, there's really not a lot to demo here, but in honor of Ricky, uh, I did bravely remove the middle strings from my court baritone guitar, which is about a 28 and a half inch scale, and I tuned it to Rock Lobster. <laughs> That's a C, an F, no D string, no G string, and then two Fs at the top. And here's that classic riff with just a little reverb. Honestly, is there a more recognizable riff than that in the entire post-punk canon? Uh, I think probably not. And staying down south at number six with Randy Bewley of Pylon and his uh, accidental tuning. Yet yeah, still in Athens, Georgia here and uh, a quick look at Randy and, and this kind of naive tuning of his. Uh, like the rest of Pylon, uh, Randy had no musical training whatsoever. They were all art students at UGA in Athens. Um, and by the time he'd figured out that he tuned his guitar all wrong, they'd already written songs uh, and Randy had found his sound. Uh, so that tuning stuck. And that tuning is uh, A, D, G, C, E, E, which is quite the departure from standard, you know, that little cluster of A, D, G aside. Randy played very few full chords across all six strings. Uh, he tended to use semi-open arpeggios and these odd little triads, you know, these pretty minimal kind of single note lines, uh, usually working in the opposite direction to the bass line. And yeah, yeah the occasional... Um, you know, funky strumming styles, uh, an odd use of harmonics for punctuation. Yeah, uh, no demo for this one because his stuff is pretty tough to decipher without really devoting some serious time to it. But for recommendations, yeah, uh, you go listen to Dub or Beep or Crazy from Pylon and uh, you'll get to hear the full range of Randy's playing from those three tracks. At uh, number seven, I've got Alan Sparhawk of Low and Open G Tuning. Yeah, uh, after a few head scratches in a, yeah, what the fuck is that tuning sense, some calmer water maybe with Alan and his uh, almost universal uh, adaption of the open G tuning for the music of low. Yeah, Alan stated that he found open G, that's uh, D, G, D, G, B, D, at about the age of 19. Uh, he loved how it sounded and quickly uh, changed his playing and writing style to use it as his default tuning. Yeah, this one falls into the category of the more kind of accepted, if you like, alternative tunings, which often have their roots in blues or folk or other traditional forms of music. Yeah, Open G itself is a very common blues or slide guitar tuning, probably most strongly linked in a kind of a rock sense with uh, Keith Richards of the Stones. Um, although in his case, he dispenses with that low uh, D string altogether, playing with only five strings. Yeah, if you've heard Brown Sugar, you've heard Open G tuning. Okay, a bit about strings and frequency, yeah. Uh, open notes sound different to fretted notes, mostly because of the length of the string and to an extent because of the different material of the guitar's nut, you know, which is usually bone or a synthetic alternative, uh, and the frets, which are usually nickel steel. So a string vibrating generates a tone, a note, uh, which will develop further harmonic frequencies related to the fundamental note, and it's this that is affected by the string length. You want an example? What this, for instance, is why a short scale bass will often be described as sounding thuddy. Uh, when compared to the longer scale equivalent, the string is shorter, resulting in less extra harmonic content, resulting in that fundamental note standing out more. It feels less complex, more rooted, yeah, thuddier. And this is, I think, why players like Alan, uh, myself, are drawn to open tunings, even though they may be writing using chords that are just as easy to play in standard tuning. Yeah, in an open tuning, some chords will just sound richer, fuller, uh, more complex, more musical. 
Uh, that's my take, but I don't know how much of that comes across to the average listener. But but for what it's worth, here's a rough take of uh, Violence from Lowe's Long Division album uh, in Open G Tuning. Oh, and I'm just using the neck mini humbucker on this homemade telly of mine, which is really close to Alan's Telecaster of the same period. Uh, some reverb too from the uh, new neighbour stereo white reverb for those, uh, you know, primary atmospherics. side note before moving on umg universal music group do the right thing and return the rights of those early low recordings back to alan at 25 years down the line and you owe it to low to alan the family to give them back control of their own music please uh, next on the list and this one kind of rolls up string length alternative tunings and varying numbers of strings into one package yeah at eight on this list i've got jeff martin of idaho and his tenor tunings yeah, and after Low, Jeff's band Idaho were another of those uh, slowcore bands to emerge in the first half of the 1990s. Yeah, integral to the Idaho sound were the custom-made electric tenor guitars. That's short scale with only four strings that the band used. Yeah, electric tenors are fairly rare in more modern music. Um, Neko Case and Warren Ellis are the only ones that spring to mind. Uh, but acoustic tenors have a fairly long tradition in folk music. Yeah, a couple of standard, if you like, tenor tunings would be C, G, D, A. Uh, or there's the Irish fiddle tuning, that's G, D, A, E, which is just an inversion of the four low strings, you know, of a standard guitar. Um, that's one that I've used a lot. Uh, Jeff, however, wrote and performed in a dizzying number of four string tunings over the years, uh, which you should see on screen right now uh, with the songs that they're associated with them alongside. Anyway, I'll get on with this one. Yeah, here's me and my uh, Warren Ellis tenor uh, tuned to E, C sharp, F sharp, B, um, trying to play the wonderful God's Green Earth, the opening track from the Year After Year album. Again, I've just added a little bit of that reverb for some atmosphere. a little warbly in spots due to some questionable string gauges in there but I, I think it's a really lovely and unique sound and uh, if you have the equipment the patience the inclination I can thoroughly recommend a tenor guitar as a creative uh, shot in the arm yeah most modern day you know alt guitar variations tend to focus on you know more strings seven eight you know that Chapman stick thing uh, or, or on lower tunings you know tuning down to D's C's B's but this is quite the opposite and all the better for it. Okay, next at nine, I've got Ian Krauss of Disco Inferno and his MIDI sampling guitar. Yeah, just a quick mention here as I've talked about Disco Inferno at length before. This uh, is what happens when you're prepared to chance it all and take a creative leap. Yeah, it's almost like we've been working our way down from six to four strings and finally, in effect, down to zero. Yeah, that's an exaggeration, I'll admit, but philosophically, uh, for Ian, uh, I think by ripping out his traditional guitar pickup and replacing it with a MIDI pickup, using his guitar to trigger hardware samples instead of, you know, honest to goodness notes, this was a real leap of faith, a step into the unknown. And it's not because Ian couldn't play well either. His traditional guitar sounds are a beautiful mix of kind of bubbling Vinnie Riley waterfalls of delay and modulation and these sweetly naive kind of Barney Sumner melodies. Yeah, this move was about consciously doing different at a time when I think Ian could see the stale fingers of tradition beginning to retighten their grip on the indie music scene after the, you know, the brief explosion of shoegaze at the start of the 90s. 
Yeah, anyway, this stuff, uh, Disco Inferno's music, it's very hard to explain. I know because I've tried already. Um, but seek out the five EPs and the incredible uh, DI Go Pop album and listen for yourself. Uh, it, it's genuinely exciting and unsettling music even now. And finally, uh, a little throwaway entry here at the end for someone who probably shouldn't even register on anyone's uh, post-punk ometer. Yes, he's a proper jazz and blues grounded player with a long history going all the way back to the 60s. He just happened to play guitar in one of the biggest new wave acts of the 70s and 80s. Yeah, 10, I've got Andy Summers of The Police and the Electro Harmonics Electric Mistress Flanger. Yeah, I'm really not going on too much here. It's the police for Christ's sake. You know, fake punks, white boys playing reggae, whatever. For a period, they were the biggest band in the world. And also for a period, they were mixing genres and styles up right at the top of the charts. So, uh, you know, give them a break. And yes, Andy used the uh, electric Mistress Flanger. And yeah, he made it sound much more like a chorus than a flanger. It's it's a great sound. I could go techie, but I'm not. Um, for me, he's here for just one reason and one reason alone. Yeah, that sound. Uh, I was seven years old around my nan's house with my cousins, uh, listening to the charts on a radio on a Sunday evening, probably dreading school the next day. Um, when I heard that chord, uh, that chord from Walking on the Moon. Uh, for me, personally, it easily surpasses that Beatles chord, you know, the Hard Day's Night chord. And, and also, you know, uh, that James Bond chord, if you like, uh, in terms of the impact it made on me personally. As I say, you can, you can find plenty more out there about Andy Summers. I'm not going to add anything more. I'm just going to say that chord. Um, yeah, it, it, it shook me. It, I'd never heard anything like it before. And it still gives me shivers. And that's all I'm going to say about that. And that's all I'm saying for today. Yeah, uh, thanks very much for watching these videos. They're pretty hard work, but um, I know a lot of you out there really appreciate them. So uh, yeah, uh, if you like it, please give it a like down below. And uh, if you want to see more content like this, I will do another one at some point. Um, yeah, why not subscribe? But yeah, that's it for uh, this episode, for this video. Um, I hope you come back. Um, I'll see you again soon. Take care. Bye for now.